Church. I'm Sarah, the pastor here, and we are grateful to have you join us this morning for our contemporary worship service. Some of you may have a very busy day later on, but we are very excited that you have taken this time to join us and to share our love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so as we begin this morning, we're going to do so with prayer. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you have revealed yourself to us in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what it is to be human. You know our struggles and our celebrations. You know our joys and our sorrows. And because of this, you draw closer to us in our time of need. You allow us to express ourselves in abandonment. And for this, we love that we are free to tell you all that we think and feel, all that we have experienced and all the things with which we lean into you for your strength and your comfort. And so as we enter into this time of worship, we give thanks for your presence, for the way in which you allow us to have sacralized space where a portion of yourself always dwells. The truth of the gospel account of Matthew, wherever two or more are gathered in the, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there he is also. And of course, that your Holy Spirit moves in us and among us. So for the triune nature of our worship, we rejoice. And we pray as that we move deeper into this time that you will reveal to us your holy truth, your love and your grace, and that once more we might leave edified and encouraged by your love for us. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand as you are able as we join together in our opening music, and we're going to start with How Great is Our God. How great is our God? How great 
Savior, I know for sure. All of my days are held in your hand, crafted into your perfect plan. You gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit, teach me, dear Lord. children who would like to come forward for children's time, you are welcome to do that. Got some things to show you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So I want to show you a couple things here because 
we have a very busy week this week at church. So on Tuesday, it's Shrove Tuesday, which means that's when churches all over the world are going to be using up their milk and their eggs and their butter. And one of the best ways to do this is with pancakes. So we're going to serve hundreds of pancakes on Tuesday. And guess how much they cost? They're free. You are welcome to come and eat pancakes. You want to come eat pancakes? What do you think? Yeah? Who thinks they can eat three pancakes? Yeah? Do you think you can eat 12 pancakes? No. Oh, no? All right, well, we'll see. But five whole pancakes? Okay, all right, we'll see. But what happens is that's getting us ready for Wednesday, which is Ash Wednesday. That's the start of Lent. So starting on Wednesday, our pyramids, the hangings here that are currently green, what color are they going to turn? Do you know what color lets us know Easter is coming? White. Not white. Easter is white. Purple. Good job, Harper. Purple. They'll be purple. And then they'll stay purple for a few Sundays, and then it will be Easter. And so one of the things that we do during that purple time, during Lent, is that we are helping ourselves be more holy, be more like God. And there's a lot of ways that people do that. In fact, I've got two things that people use to help them be more holy here. So this is a rosary. It looks kind of like a necklace, but you're not supposed to wear it like a necklace. This has prayer beads. See all the little beads? So what you would do is, as you are using the beads, you would be saying prayers like Our Father. Um, they have some other prayers in the Catholic Church that we don't normally say, but you'd be praying. They have beads, right? This one was actually blessed by Pope Francis, and my friend brought it back when she visited from Rome. So this is a very cool rosary to me. Now, since we're not Catholic, this may not be up your alley as much, but these are Anglican prayer beads. Notice they're a little shorter, right? Not so many prayers, a little shorter. Uh, and so you can do this a little quicker. Uh, we come from the Anglican Church. The Methodist Church comes from the Anglican Church. And so you can still count. You can use the beads to count. You ever use anything to count? Counters, right? You use these to count. However, because we're Methodist and Pastor Sarah... Uh, definitely prefers soft, fudgy, tangible things over here. I got you prayer bears for Lent. So all of, I have a whole bunch of these little bears. They're very soft. They have these tags. I've got my name on mine. But you can put your name on here. I used a Sharpie. You can use um, any kind of marker probably. And you can write on there your name, but you could also write on there a prayer. And then instead of having to count beads, you can be holding your bear and you can be praying more because one of the things that Christians all over the world and for almost 2,000 years have been doing in Lent is learning to pray more as we get closer to Easter. So then I figured if you had something really soft to touch that, that might encourage you to pray more, what do you think? And this has a keychain. So where could you hang something so that it will remind you to pray? Your backpack? Where else could you put it? You could hang it like in your room, right? Or you could you can even hang it up in your bathroom if that's where you like brush your teeth and you could be thinking about praying. What do you think? So I think if you put a nail here and yes. a nail on it. You could hang it on a nail or a hook. Good idea. Fantastic. But before you put a nail on the wall, ask your parents, okay? All right. So I have a big old basket of prayer bears up here. Would you like them now or would you like them later? Right, right now, of course, I figured, you know, just figured. Okay, they are all the same. I personally went through and made sure they were all the same. Would you like one? We're just gonna go around the circle. You can grab any one you want. They are exactly the same. Are they soft? You like that? There you go, there you go. Who has an idea of what they're gonna be praying for this Lent? You can absolutely take one for your sister. Absolutely. You. You're welcome. Would you like one? You. You're welcome. Miss Harper, would you like one, my dear? And I will have them up here if anybody else would like one for later. We'll keep them up here. Um, and you are welcome to those. So before we go to children's worship, let, oh, let me grab mine. Let's pray with our bears. You ready? Yeah. All right. So hold it in your hands. And can you repeat after me? Yeah. There you go, Julianne. 
I like it. Okay, you ready to pray together? I'm going to start. Can you repeat? Dear God, God, thank you you for prayer prayer and these these prayer bearers bearers to help us us remember remember and grow grow our prayer life. life. Amen. Okay, well done, guys. If you would like to go to children's worship, you are welcome to do that. We have our amazing group over here that will take you. All right. You ready? <laughs> there we go. Prayer, bells, prayer bears felt like the next natural iteration in a long line of prayer beads. So that's how we got to those today. Well, before we hear our scripture as we continue this journey through the movements of God's grace into sanctification, I'm going to invite us to pray once more. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of prayer, for the ability to communicate with you both out loud and spoken and internally and in the ways in which our thoughts and the emotions of our hearts are conveyed to the highest heavens to reach you. And we are grateful, Lord, that you not only hear our prayers, but that you receive them and you respond in ways that we could never fully anticipate nor understand, but in all things, help us to trust you. And when we pray to you, surround us with tangible signs of your love. Remind us that we are beloved of sacred worth and that we are the ones that you have asked to continue to love and forgive and bless this world in your holy name. And because we have such great works, a blessing to do, we pray that you will grant us strength. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from 2 Thessalonians. That's not how we spell that. Chapter 2, verses 17 through 13. We all go on to perfection. Okay, so here's what it says. But we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose, he called you through our proclamation of the good news so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. So I know normally when I break out the book of discipline, some of you go, I know that. Um, But I do want to share with you that since last week we were focusing on justification, that movement of grace that justifies us and allows us to stand tall before our Lord, completely cleansed of our sin. Today we're going to move into the third movement of God's grace, that first being provenient, which I didn't think you needed an entire sermon on provenient grace. That was provenient for you, that I didn't do that. Instead, today we're going to come to the third movement, which is not the final encounter that we have with God's grace, but it is the one that is constantly at work in us when we are engaged with our relationship with God. And so the book of discipline has a lot of things in it. This is our rule book. It is our history book in the United Methodist Church. It has all the lineage of the bishops going all the way back to Thomas Koch and Francis Asbury. It will tell you how to run a committee meeting if you should ever find yourself an extremist and need to do that. You can do that with this book. But one of the beautiful things about this book is that it also contains our doctrinal standards and our general rules. And despite the the girth of the book, we only have three general rules. The first is to do no harm by avoiding evil. The second is to do all the good that you can. And the third is to attend upon the ordinances of God. And what are those ordinances? These are the ways in which we can engage with the third movement of God's grace to sanctify, to make us holy. And that is 
through. I'm going to read it to you first in the uh, very formal way, and then I'll break it down to you in some more common vernacular. But here are the ordinances of God as contained in the Bible. The first is the public worship of God, the ministry of the word, either read or expounded, the supper of the Lord, family and private prayer, searching the scriptures, fasting or abstinence. And so what that means is that we have been given various ways, modes, experiences, and encounters with God's grace and God's holy word and absolutely with the presence of God in order to grow, to deepen our relationship with God, which bears fruit in our sanctification, our holiness. And the first is public worship. Congratulations, you've already done one today. You're ahead of half of the world. You are doing a good job. Public worship of God, it's important because it is here that we actually get number two, the ministry of the word, preaching and teaching on God's word. We get that right here. And so now you have two. You are so awesome this morning. Look at you. The third is called the Supper of the Lord, or as many of us refer to it, Holy Communion, which we did last week, and which we will do again on the first Sunday in March. And so we have this opportunity. However, if for any reason you felt that you were being led, called, or needed to have Holy Communion, you can contact me, you can contact the church office, and we can give you Holy Communion when you need it. Sometimes I have people who ask for it before surgery or before a major test. I've had people who have asked for it because they've had something traumatic happen and they need to feel God's love and grace and presence. And so God knows that that sacrament is one of the ways that we experience God's love and grace and we are forgiven in it. And so we have this opportunity to experience God's grace in a way that helps us to live it out in our lives. The fourth is family and private prayer, or the better way to put this would be corporate prayer, not necessarily with your biological family, but you could do it with a small group, a part of your family of faith. You could do it in worship. Uh, private prayer, individual prayer that we engage in. We're called to be in prayer together, but also individually, because God wants to hear from God's people, but also God wants to hear from us as individual disciples. And so we're encouraged to do both of those, searching the scriptures, reading your Bible. It's really important to read our Bible. It's important to read our Bible because a lot of work and suffering and redemption has gone into this book. And this isn't even able to encompass all of what God has done. But it's a good start for us because it's a place where we can come together, we can grow, we can ask questions, we can ponder, we can wonder. And searching the scriptures is a fantastic opportunity to see how other people have experienced God's grace and get instruction for ourselves. What is God calling us to do? Who is God calling us to be? All of those are fantastic reasons to read your Bible and also because Jesus says so. That's usually a very good reason. The last are uh, twofold, fasting and abstinence. These are those times where we deny our physical bodies so that we can focus on spiritual matters. Now, I'm not talking about intermittent fasting or dieting fasting or you just don't have access to food fasting. I'm talking about intentional fasting, which is a spiritual discipline. It's something that I've engaged in for probably 20 years now, where after my dinner on Saturday night, I will not eat until after we conclude Sunday morning worship, which is why if you catch me right about one o'clock and I haven't yet had brunch, I am in like very hangry mode. Um, and so this is one of the things though, because optimally at this point, because let's see, how long has it been now? Um, it's probably been about 15 hours since I ate. And according to public speaking, I should not be able to do what I'm doing with you right now. It's only by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit that I can function on Sunday morning, which is a testimony to what God is able to do with human weakness. And so my fasting is a part of my religious life, um, but there are others who will fast more regularly, perhaps multiple times a week. There are others who will set about a period of fasting for Lent. You have people that do that. And fasting is a way to kind of take our emphasis off of ourselves physically and start to connect with God. Because when you are really hangry and you're making everybody else angry, it's only God that seems to give you any grace. You ever notice that? Everybody's like, just eat a Snickers. And you're like, no, 
I'm trying to do this. And you're like, God, why don't they understand? And then you actually end up connecting in a deeper level with God because Jesus fasted multiple times throughout his earthly ministry. And so Jesus understands what is happening there. And of course, abstinence. There's a time for us to not engage in sexual gratification so that we can express a love in a different way. And so all of those are a means of grace for us when we engage in them, not just our physicality, but our spirituality. And so that's why John Wesley and Methodism throughout the ages has continued to encourage us to do these things to experience sanctification. But in our letter today that we read, the second letter to Thessalonica, what we find is that one, this is probably not actually written by the Apostle Paul. It's probably a later letter, as indicative by the fact that it says at verse 15, so then brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us. Traditions, I mean, that's pretty, pretty rich when it just happened, but what we're probably seeing is that this letter was written probably a decade or more after Paul, so that Paul's churches had started traditions, carrying on the things that they did with him and after him, and this is encouraging us to do that. There are some things that we do by tradition, like some of those means of grace. There are some things that we do because Christians have done them consistently and have found strength and comfort in them, and so we continue to do them today. That's why we continue to meet for corporate worship. Personal devotion is beautiful, and you should have that too, but corporate worship is vital to us as part of our tradition that comes not just from the scriptures, but it comes from the greater experience of Christendom. It comes from the personal experience that we have. And so all of these things are God giving us the opportunity to fulfill the words of the second letter to Thessalonica, which is this, God has chosen you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification. That God's grace moving in you is bearing fruit for the world. That others will, be, will consume and will be nurtured by the fruit that you are in the world. It's important for us to realize this. God uses our faith, our relationship with God to bless and nurture other people. We are not blessed by Jesus Christ for our own individual good. God loves you individually. God is happy to bless you individually. But it's not just about me and God. It's about us and God and those that do not yet realize that they are God's beloved. And we are being called to give our testimony, not just let me tell you how Jesus Christ is amazing, but our testimony and how we live, how we speak to other people, how we engage, our acts of kindness, our acts of mercy, these things are indicative of the fruitfulness of salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. And so when the people of Thessalonica were hearing this, they were hearing that God had a purpose for their faith. God could use their faith to change the world. Now in this case, it's actually been recorded in the Bible. What greater purpose could you have? And I know a lot of us are thinking, well, there's probably not going to be the letter to Crozet. Well, there probably won't be a letter to Crozet, but that doesn't mean that you are not a letter to Crozet. You are the living word. You are the embodiment of the living word of God. And it's important for your life to be a testimony. Now, God had been telling God's people for a very long time to pursue sanctification. That is to be made holy, to sanctify. We are in a sanctuary. It is a place that has been consecrated and holy and a piece of God's self. God the Father dwells here. That's why we have this holy space. And if you go, now there are many, many places, but I'm only going to read you two of my favorite citations from the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And the first is from Exodus 31, 13, where God says this through Moses, you yourself are to speak to the Israelites. You shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. That by keeping a Sabbath, keeping a day that you mark as holy, 
where you focus on God. For some of us, that might be today, the Lord's day. For others of us, it is a day where we do no normal work, ordinary things. Maybe it's a day of reflection, of rest. Maybe it is a day of our spiritual disciplines. But we set aside a day as a testimony to the world that we are God's people that God is holy and so we yearn for that same holiness. We want to express that in the world. It's said so clearly in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. And I know some of you are going, really Leviticus? Listen to this. Listen to what God says in Leviticus. For I am the Lord your God. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be holy. For I am holy. It is a choice that we make to engage with God's grace to be made holy. Not holier than thou, holy. To reflect something other in the world. One of the the benefits of my undergraduate studies in non-Christian religion was that I took an entire course on the theories of religion. And there are many theories of how religion functions and whether it functions or not, and what is the purpose, what is driving the cultivation of so many religions across time and space and culture in the world. And one of those theories is about the sacred and the profane. Not profane as in profanity, however, the root of profanity is common. It was the language of common people, and you didn't want to speak that profanity, and so you wanted to elevate your language. So think about the sacred and the common. The sacred is that which is holy, it is of God, it is, it is about our faith in God, and the common is about the rest of the world. It is about what humankind has put forth as important. It is about what we as a species have done and feel driven to do versus what God is calling us to do. And for a lot of people, that tension between the sacred and the common molds our faith life. Back when the pandemic hit and our bishop at the time, Bishop Lewis, did what she thought was best for us and she closed in-person worship, um, what happened was that a lot of people started to express this need for the sacred. I had people that were like, I don't want to worship in a parking lot. I want to be in the sanctuary because this space held sacred meaning for them. This was a space where they had encountered God's presence. This is a space where God's people had gathered for worship. And so they understood that holiness was here, and they yearned to be in the presence of God in a holy place. They didn't want to be in a parking lot. There's parking lots all over the place. They didn't want to be in a parking lot. They wanted to be in the house of God. And that is an understanding of that. And then I would get into conversations with some of my colleagues, and they'd be like, I don't understand why my people are so resistant to worshiping in the parking lot. And I was like, well, if it were that easy, we could have saved a whole lot of money by not building churches. But because we have this understanding of the holiness that happens in this room, we do yearn to see it fulfilled. And that's what God is talking about in sanctification you were created in the image of god now what that means has been debated by much more brilliant people than me but i can tell you this sanctification is about showing that image of god to the world it is about letting god's grace work from within you so if you were here last week and you took holy communion with us you got to experience that justifying grace knowing that your past was cleansed. God is not holding any of what you did against you anymore. The rest of us need to follow suit. And so what God is saying is, I am making you new. You are reborn. You are cleansed from the inside out. But God doesn't just leave you. God is not just a great physician that heals you when you are sick and sends you back out in the world and says, next time you're sick, come back. That's not who our God is. Our God says, I want to help you resist what made you sick. I want to help you reflect the glory in which you were created. I want you to be a testimony to the world that I am still very much here and in love with humankind. And so there is a piece of that grace that is still within you. Even now, a week later, 
There is a piece of that grace that is moving and growing. It's nurturing the Holy Spirit. If you've received the Holy Spirit through baptism and the laying of hands, then that is feeding God's presence within you. And it is encouraging you to continue the good works. And we know what they are. We know what we should be doing on some level. But for some of us, it's hard to just do it, to make the commitment to do what we know that we're supposed to be doing. You know, one of the things that happens when you become clergy is that people will ask you, like, what made you want to be clergy? That's the wrong question. None of us wanted to be clergy. Nobody was like, oh, this will be such a great future for me. You know, to be drastically underpaid and all this kind of stuff and having to move at the whim of a bishop who I may or may not even know and then to, you know, love God's people for however long I love God's people and then when people are upset, it's my fault. We all wake up in the morning, we're like, career? No, no, that's not what happens. God says, I want to call you to a holy life And I want to call you to a life that is even more separate, set apart than Christendom. Because most of us were like, we were fully in in the Christian thing. Like, we wanted to be lay people. That was great. But then this whole clergy thing, is that what we wanted? But God wasn't asking us what we wanted. God was telling us what we needed. God tells us what we need. If I had stayed a lay person, I would be a really crappy lay person. I would. I would be a crappy lay person. I know what would happen. I'd be like, oh my gosh, they have such a great brunch menu at this place. Let's just go there. Or, oh, you know what? I I only get two days off a week. How am I supposed to spend half of it getting dressed up and then go to church? I know what would happen. And then people would be like, why don't you read this book? And I would be like, or not. I've got a whole bunch of series. Like currently, I've gone back and I'm binge watching Melrose Place. I have things to do. I would not be who I am today if God hadn't put a call on my life. And God is putting a call on your life. Do not mistake me. Just because God may not be, and God may be, calling you to some elevated form of leadership in the church, God is not saying, you all are done, I've already got one. That is not what God is saying. God is saying to you that you have the ability, the power, the authority, the grace to share my love. And we do that, you'll be amazed you know, when people, I met somebody one time and they were like, hey, we should get together on a Thursday. And I'm like, I can't do a Thursday. And they're like, why? And I was like, I have Bible study. They're like, can't you miss? I was like, no, not really. No. They're like, you're that dedicated to it? I was like, I teach it. They were like, oh, you're one of those. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Because something happens when we read this together. Something happens to me when I read this with you. Something happens in the world where we can see the opportunity. You know, we, I know we think that we are innovating all kinds of things in the world, and we do. We innovate some beautiful things in the world. However, we still do some of the same stuff. We still do some of the same stuff. I mean, I've had conversations with my kid. I'm like, let me tell you where this is going to lead you. And he's like, how do you think you know that? I'm like, because this is straight up Joseph from Genesis. Straight up. And unless you're going to become vice president, you need to make a new decision. Because this is what we're talking about. Some of our behaviors are clearly outlined here. The good and the bad. And we could learn, and we can show people a different, better way. We can allow God's grace to be fruitful in us. God didn't give us the Bible. God didn't give us the sacraments. God didn't give us a portion of God's self and the Holy Spirit so that we could just feel good for an hour on Sunday morning. That is a waste of God's time. But more than that, my siblings in Christ, Think of all the people, just like you and me, who have done so much work and invested of themselves that these messages, 
these means of grace, these opportunities for holy encounter would not die. That they wouldn't die and go away. That instead, we would have the opportunity to enliven them, to freshen them up, to give them a new opportunity to speak in powerful ways that we ourselves would be the next iteration of those apostles. Because we are a people who are not perfect. But God says, on the path of sanctification, I continually give you the other movements the provenient grace, the grace that comes before, the justifying grace, the grace that lets us be cleansed when we messed up and stand justified, but the grace that also reminds us that we have to forgive other people. They have been forgiven by God. And I was reminded this past week in a conversation that being forgiven by God does not fix your life. I was reminded by that. It doesn't fix your life but it does give you the strength to do the work of reconciliation and forgiveness that needs to be done. Whether you need to be doing the forgiving or you need to be forgiven, it helps you. You know, if God who knows everything you have ever done, oh yeah, even that, if God who knows everything that you've ever done is able to forgive you and wipe you clean, then you should have some confidence and being able to go forth in life and say to someone, I messed up, I'm sorry. It should give you the confidence to go forth in life and say to someone, you know, I really need us to talk about what happened last week because it hurt me and I'm still hurting and I'm struggling with it and you are important to me and God wants us to be one in Jesus Christ and so I need us to talk about this gives you the opportunity and empowers you to do that reconciliation that needs to happen. You know, I grew up in Virginia. I thought we had a great educational system in Virginia. Thought I had a, a really good, you know, it helps that like half of US history like happened in this state, that helps. It's like, it's a really good bonus. But one of the great things about all the history that I got inundated with over the course of my life, even in college, is that you start to pay attention to history and you realize that half of the unintended consequences and the ramifications of things that have happened in world history and in United States history and in indeed even Virginia history comes because people were not reconciled. Go back and look at World War II. If we had behaved differently at the age of World War I, I believe that we could have pursued reconciliation and changed the trajectory of what became World War II. Because when you dehumanize people, you make them angry and vengeful. When you teach people that they are nothing, then all they want to do is reduce you to nothing. And you see that lived out in World War II. You see that lived out into the horrible consequences of millions and millions of people dead. What if reconciliation could have saved lives? Now maybe the reconciliation that needs to happen in your life is not going to save 25 million people. But what if you could look back on your life and realize that the reconciliation that you did with one person saved one person? Just one. Most of us will spend time at some point in our life wondering what we accomplished, what did we fail, what is our legacy, who are we, is God going to forgive us, are we okay? We start asking these esoteric but very important questions of ourselves. And that's why I have told you time and time again, when you are in doubt of what to say or what to do, love. Amen. Because love is at the core of reconciliation. Love is at the core of forgiveness. Love is at the core of God's grace. God grants us grace because God loved us even before we were. God loved us in the womb. God loved us before we even had self-actualization, self-awareness. God has loved us from the very beginning, and God loves the person that you can't stand from the very beginning. And nothing would make God happier than if you were reconciled. For much of my life, 
my, well, actually, maybe not, that's not so true anymore. Uh, my sister and her husband just celebrated their 10th anniversary, and I performed the wedding. And I remember my sister saying to me, it's been 10 years, and we haven't killed each other yet. And I'm like, yeah, squaggles. Let's not kill each other. That's a good marriage. But I remember her saying, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I never would have thought that would have been possible because we spent so much of our lives with this rift. We were very different people. We had been raised different ways. There's about 10 years between my sister and I. I am a solid Gen Xer and she is a millennial. And we just don't see the world the same way, even though we grew up in the same house with the same parents. We're just not the same people. And frankly, she annoyed me for a lot of it. And so you think about it and it's like, you know, it is really amazing that after all of that, that we can have this beautiful relationship. And I remember my mother saying to me one time, you know, after we had done the marriage and she and I, have, you know, I had talked to her almost every single day now. And my mother had said, you know, I was worried that I was gonna die and you and your sister were gonna hate each other. And I was like, mom, I don't hate Katie. I have never hated Katie. I love Katie, I just can't stand Katie. I love Katie, I just can't stand her. My mom's like, well, I needed more than that. That's what God's saying to us. I need more than you love somebody, but you can't stand them. That's what reconciliation is, and that's what sanctification makes possible for us. All over Christendom today, there are a lot of churches that are celebrating today as Transfiguration Sunday. It's the day when Jesus went up onto the mountaintop with some of his closest apostles, and he was transfigured. His clothes turned dazzling white, whiter than snow, whiter than bleach, according to some of the gospel accounts. He was transfigured, and he was shown there with Elijah and Moses. They suddenly appeared with him, and it was all evidencing the fact that Jesus is holy and who Jesus is as the Messiah. All of that is happening there. And while a lot of churches are focusing on that, and I had about 30 seconds this morning where I was like, should I really have done transfiguration? The Holy Spirit said no, because I want you to focus on transfiguring yourselves. You be transformed. Participate with this. You know, that's the great thing. God is not going to make you into something that you don't want to do. God is not going to make you do anything. You know, even, even clergy, we're like, oh, we had to. We didn't have a choice. Okay, that's not true. We had a choice. We weren't going to like the choice, so we picked what we picked. But God does not force you to do something. God gives you the invitation. God may invite you a lot, but God is giving you the invitation. Sanctification is you saying, I'm in. I'm in. I have faith because of your provenient movement of grace. I have been cleansed and freed and justified by your justifying movement of grace. And God, make me holy because you are holy. Make me holy. And that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Not until Jesus comes back and we get new spiritual bodies that will never sin will we be perfect. However, don't you want to try to get as close as you possibly can? Get close. Get better. Yeah, that's one of the beautiful things about becoming old clergy. And trust me, I'm getting old because I see the new ones, and I'm like, oh, are you out of high school? You know, you see the new ones. They're very young and vibrant. And I see them, and they're like, they have all these dreams and ambitions, and it's beautiful. And the Holy Spirit is speaking through them in such powerful ways. And I'm like, I remember when I was like that so many years ago. And what you end up finding is this, that God is constantly saying to people, Look how far you've come. Let's celebrate how far you've come. Let's celebrate who you are right now. And let's look together at who you can be. And let's take that walk together. Let's go that way together. Because I do hear and read about things that my younger clergy colleagues are experiencing and how they're reacting. And I go, yeah, I remember when I would have reacted like that. I remember when that would have like really upset me and I would have died on that hill. I can remember that. But you know what? The more I read this book, the more I realize that there aren't very many hills we're dying on. Instead, there are hills where we climb and we invite other people to come and experience our God. Those are the hills I want to climb, not the ones I die on. I want to climb the hills and 
invite as many people as possible to come with me on that hill and go, look at our God. Look at our God. That's what sanctifying grace does. It, it helps you to get over your own issues. It helps you to be the person that helps other people go, I know that that pushes your buttons. I get it. I understand it because it pushed my buttons too. But I'll tell you what, we have bigger fish to fry because Jesus wants us to feed the world. And we have a lot of fish to fry if we're going to feed the world. We have a lot. And so a lot of the things that I was so passionate about when I was younger, I'm like, that doesn't really matter anymore. It doesn't really matter to me. You know, when you used to be virulent about the little things, right? Little traditions and stuff like that. And you were like, this can never change. If you told me that wearing a robe right now for contemporary service would bring 20 people to Christ, I'd go put my robe on. Because that's more important than me standing here without a robe. I put that robe on at 11 o'clock because I am virulent about tradition. And so at 11 o'clock, I put that robe on. But if you told me I could take that robe off and 20 people will come to Jesus Christ, I'd take the robe off. Because it's not about doing things for the sake of doing things. It's about doing things for God. And what is the impact that they're having? And right now, some people are giving up of their time in corporate worship right now. They left with the kids. They're out there teaching the kids because they believe that that sacrifice is worth it for the kingdom. That's holy living. And that is what we are called to. When will we sacrifice? When will we show the world something other? What will we do? And it looks different for many of us because sanctification is God's gift to each of us individually. It is your gift. God is giving that to you because God wants to be with you forever, not just on Sundays, not just in this life, but forever. And so the next time you think about what it means to let grace be alive in you, remember sanctification, that you are being made holy. And if you feel like you've messed it up, God will bring you right back to the table, welcome you home like every other prodigal Christian, cleanse you of your sin, and go with you back out into the world. That is the God that we serve. That is the God who sanctifies us. And this is why the church is as important as ever, because the world needs to experience our loving, grace-filled God. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. And as our, I think our children are coming back. Maybe. As they come back, you know, we're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. And if you are looking for a way to uh, deepen your relationship with this body of Christ here, you can fill out these welcome home cards that are in the pews. Just a name and an email, and we will get connected with you and we look forward to nurturing that relationship and those cards can go in the offering baskets or you can turn them in on your way out of the sanctuary but for now let us bask in the presence of our god and worship that same lord with our tithes and our offerings Let us pray. God, pour out your Holy Spirit and your blessing on these gifts. 
so that they may continue to preach and teach and reveal your grace to the world in our missions, in our ministries, in our response when those turn to us in their time of need and yearn for help. We rejoice that because of these gifts, we are able to respond as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did and does. Thanks be to you, Almighty God, for these holy truths and for our ability to continue the good work that you began so many generations ago. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. A few quick announcements for you. The first is that, as I mentioned, Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. It's also Valentine's Day, uh, the Feast of St. Valentine for our Catholic siblings in Christ. And so we hope that you will consider joining us for one of our opportunities to receive the imposition of ashes. We're going to have our traditional worship service at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary that evening. Um, you can come to worship. We will have the imposition of ashes at night. In the morning, you can have the drive-through imposition of ashes in the church parking lot from 7 to 8.30 a.m. And if you need them during the day, if you're unable to come in the morning and you can't come at night, reach out to me or the church office, and I do have them and be happy to give them to you. Our ashes are made of palm branches from the previous Palm Sunday, previous year's Palm Sunday, and we mix them with myrrh oil, which is one of the oils that was given to both honor Jesus by the Magi and also that was used in burial rites, which the women were probably bringing to the tomb on Easter morning. The United Women in Faith have their quarterly luncheon today, and so if you would like to join them after the 11 a.m. worship service at about 12.15 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, it's a great opportunity to hear about our United Women in Faith, and they are critical to the life of our church. They do some incredible mission work, and we encourage you to check them out. And then, of course, Trove Tuesday Pancake Dinner this week. It's your opportunity to carve up for Christ. On February 13th, we'll host our annual pancake dinner from 5 to 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Come on out, enjoy pancake syrup, and the amazing friendship and fellowship that follows. If you'd like to be involved in the preparation or in the hosting, you can email Bart at communications at crozetunitedmethodist.com. And then the hygiene kit collection for UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, continues this month. Uh, the bin is in the back to put them in. So many of you have brought them uh, during the week as well into the office, and we're thank so grateful for your participation in this. Consider taking um, the opportunity to bring some of the items like hand towels, toothbrushes, fingernail clippers, etc. They're used in the U.S. during disaster relief opportunities, including tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, landslides, and blizzards. And then our social justice ministry here at Crozet will be meeting Sunday, February 18th at 1215 in the Fellowship Hall. We will have a report on the recent research activities and the progress on IMPACT's current year campaigns for affordable housing in Albemarle County and improved public transportation across our region. If you'd like more information or you would like to RSVP, you can contact Leela Law and we can put you in touch with her in the church office. Refreshments will be served and all are welcome. And then the seed and the salt will take the week off. We're encouraging the seed, the fourth, third, fourth, and fifth graders to participate in our Shrove Tuesday and Ash Wednesday opportunities. And the salt are pretty much gonna be rained out today. So they will come back next week. But we are grateful for all of the ways in which our small groups are very present in revealing God's holiness in the community. And so now we invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together our closing song, This Is Amazing Grace.
you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the earth? these prayer bearers in the back. If you or someone in your life would be blessed to have them, you are welcome to. to as if you have grandchildren that you want to send them to, you're welcome to them. I have a whole bunch of them. So, hello, Miss Julianne. What's up, girl? Okay. Good? All right, girl. <laughs> Will you receive this blessing? God's sanctifying grace is within you, and God's love is upon you. So as you prepare to leave this place and go back out into the world, do not fear. Do not be afraid. Go forth knowing that you are known and loved and profoundly forgiven, and go forth to do the same. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen. This is amazing.